Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for making me whole. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for him tonight. Hallelujah. He's so wonderful. He deserves all the glory, all the honor, all the praise that we can give to him. Hallelujah. God bless you richly. It blesses my heart when you praise him the way you do. And I'm sure that he's overjoyed in heaven. Oh, no, 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 he's not overjoyed in heaven. He's right here in our midst. We are two or three are gathered in his name. He is right here receiving the glory and the honor and the praise. Hallelujah. God bless you richly. You may be seated now. I'm in the book of John and tonight, if you would turn with me, please. The book of John, chapter 4. And we're going to be reading from verse 34. Are we all there? John chapter 4. Did I say verse 34? Okay, let's go to verse 46. <laughs> 34 sounds familiar. It's not verse 34, it's section 34. <laughs> that is what is confusing me. All right, it's verse... <laughs> so we're in verse 46, right? So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he made water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down before my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was going down, his servant met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And himself believed and his whole house. As you read through the Gospels, we can read of many things that Jesus did while here upon earth. We would see very clearly as we read it through that Jesus was no respecter of persons. You read the Gospels, beginning in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all that you see that Jesus had done while he was here upon earth, that's what's recorded 
For as I said some time ago, and John himself says, if everything that Jesus did was recorded, was written, the books in the world would not be able to contain it. But for what we read, we can clearly see that Jesus was no respecter of persons. No one was too lowly. Not even the beggars, like blind Bartimaeus. No one was too high in social standing that Jesus will not accommodate them. Here we have a nobleman. One of the royal family connected by birth to Herod Antipas. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? I do some reading. He left Capernaum and coming up to Galilee, besought Jesus to come down so as to heal his son. Evidently, being a nobleman, this man was financially well off. He could have easily afforded the best physicians. And I am sure that he went to just about every physician because of the malady that his son was suffering with. But evidently, everything failed. But in spite of his social standing, he did not think of himself too high to come to Jesus to ask for help. How many of you know that there are people in this world, only because of their social standing, they will not embrace Jesus Christ? And if they do embrace Jesus Christ as Savior, because of their social standing, you may not find them coming to the altar to receive prayer. Why? Because they are, as they say, too highfalutin. And I, but I thank God for doctors tonight. How many of you know doctors are very, very important people in our society? I thank God for medical profession, for the medical profession. I thank God for medical science. Despite what others may say, I thank God for medical science. But there are times when all of this will fail. But there's one thing, this one thing we know. It is that Jesus Christ never fails. So we must always thank God for Jesus. Here was an emergency. The man's son was sick and at the point of death. When we think of someone being sick at the point of death, we know that it is only a matter of time that that person can just go off into the beyond. So as a good father caring for the life of his son, there was urgency in his request. He comes to Jesus, and he's asking Jesus to come on down. My son is sick. He's at the point of death. Oh, I am reading and I can hear the urgency in the man's voice. But look at what Jesus did. Jesus looks at the man, seeing the anxiety in his face and hearing the passionate plea for his son's life. He says to the man, except you see signs and wonders you will not believe. I've been through the Gospels over and over, over the 30 years that I'm saved. And never in the Gospels could I read that Jesus said any such thing to anyone who had come to him for healing. It seems to me that whenever someone came to Jesus, he was only willing to go immediately, or to ask the person, what will you have me to do? And as the person responded, he will say something like, according to your faith, be it unto you. Nowhere in the Gospels can I read that Jesus, looking at a man whose son was 
gravely ill at the point of death. The man was making a passionate plea to Jesus. Come on down. Help my son. He's at the point of death. And Jesus looks at that man and says, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. You see, Capernaum was one of the cities that Jesus had caused to pronounce war on. Why? Because of their unbelief. They had seen miracles that Jesus performed. They had seen healings. They had seen him do many, many great things. But still they would not believe. They were always asking for a sign. Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. What Jesus was doing there, he wasn't being nasty to the man. He could never be nasty. He's Jesus, he's Lord, he's God. What Jesus was doing here, he was testing the man's faith. He was testing the man's faith. And I want to say to us here tonight that there are times when we go to him, he is going to test our faith. There are times before we call upon him, he will answer. But there are times when he's going to test our faith. You see, there were many who followed him because of the food and the fishes, the bread and so. But the Bible says he did not, Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. He knows what is in our hearts. He knows how we think. And there are times when we come to him, he will test our faith. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today. And he's the same forever, the Bible tells us. And if he tested the man's faith here, he's going to test ours. Are we waiting to see a sign? Are we waiting to see a wonder for us to believe that he says what he means and he means what he says? The question is, are we going to believe without a sign or seeing a wonder? You know, I look at healing ministries, and I see ministers saying to people after they have been prayed with, okay, bend over, look around, twist around. Why do we do that? Is it to see a sign? Is it to see a wonder? Why can't we not just accept the fact that if God says so, it is so? The nobleman, hearing Jesus say, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe, he was not deterred by what Jesus said. He could have become annoyed. He could have become annoyed at Jesus' seemingly lack of understanding of how urgent the situation was. It was indeed an urgent situation. The son's man was at the point of death. Did I say something wrong? The son's man. <laughs> what does that tell you? <laughs> I'm not perfect. The man's son <laughs> was at the point of death. But it is evident that in spite of his high social standing 
and the emergency of the situation, he was a humble man. He was a humble man. And with all humility, he said to Jesus, when he could have been annoyed, he said to Jesus, Sir, come on down before my son dies. I want us to say, I want us to understand tonight that God is God. Yes, he did say that he has called us friends. And yes, we call him friend in song. We have friends in high places. He has called us his friend and so on. But he's still God. And when we come to him, we mustn't come to him arrogantly. Too often I hear people saying, and I tell God, this is what he has to do. Not so. <laughs> Not so at all. And I tell God he must do this, and he must do that. No. We're talking about God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. We must come to him in all humility. This is how the man came, in spite of what Jesus had said to him, in spite of the fact that Jesus was testing his faith. Sir, come on down before my son dies. So if we are to receive anything of Christ, we must come to him in like manner. Not arrogantly telling him what he must do, but rather humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he will exalt us in due time. First Peter chapter 5. This man had the faith enough to believe that Jesus was able to heal his son. Evidently, he left Capernaum, he came down to Galilee, to speak to Jesus, in spite of his high calling, his high um, status, he went to Jesus, so he must have had faith huh, that Jesus was able to heal. But it was limited faith. He had no great faith. His faith was limited. It was not like the centurion. Remember the centurion? We read about the centurion in the same John. The centurion had a servant. He was sick of the palsy. He sent servants to Jesus. Now the centurion is not a Jew. This, he sent servants to Jesus, asking Jesus to heal his servant. His servants while Jesus was coming on the way. He sent other messengers to tell Jesus, listen, sir, I am not worthy to come to you. I am not worthy that you will come under my roof. But I am a man of authority. When I say go, they go. When I say come, they come. You, Jesus, just to speak the word right where you are. And my servant will be healed. What did Jesus say about that kind of faith? He said, greater faith hath no man, no, has I heard in all of Israel. So what I'm seeing here is that this man, yes, he had a degree of faith. The faith that Jesus had to be present in person so as to heal his son because that's what he was asking. Sir, come on down. He wanted Jesus there in person. He wanted Jesus present with his son so that Jesus could heal him. This was the extent of his faith. How many of you know that Jesus wants to move us from faith to faith to faith? From little faith to great faith. So that there are times when we call on him 
and we don't get the response we are expecting because we call with a degree of a faith and he knows the degree of faith and he wants to move us into a higher level of faith and so he holds back the answer until we begin to persist and persistence is what determines how great our faith is. If we leave it hanging in the air because he has not answered the first time, well, that's the level of your faith if you walk away. But as he said to the woman who went to the, who was it he went to? She went to the judge, the unjust judge. Nevertheless, when I come, will I find faith? He wants us to be able to trust him. He wants us to be able to believe him. He wants us to be able to take him at his word, not to wait to see signs and wonders before we believe. And this is what he was exercising the man with. And here was the nobleman. He had faith to believe that Jesus was able to heal, but he felt that Jesus needed to be present in person to be able to do this. Now Jesus, after the man begs him, Sir, come on, please, come on down. Here my son died. Jesus says, go your way. Go your way. Your son live it. I don't know about you, but if it were me, I stand up there and I beg in Jesus. <laughs> My son is at the point of death and you're telling me, go your way. My son live it and I'm asking you to come and heal. But look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. The man who wanted Jesus to come on down to heal his son because of the word spoken by Jesus. You see, I want to tell you tonight that there is power in the word of God. There is power. If we can only understand that there is power in the word of God. Jesus says, go your way. Your son liveth. And look what the Bible says. And the man believed the word that Jesus said. And did what? He departed. He departed. Just on the basis of what Jesus had said. Now, you and I, we know that Jesus is the Son of God. But when Jesus came and walked the face of the earth, his own people did not believe that he was whom he said he was. And if this man, this nobleman, was family to Antipas, he was not a Jew. He could not, he should not have believed. I mean, this is a man telling me, go your way, your, 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 your son will be healed. Your son liveth. And he believed the word that Jesus says. And walk. if only, if only, if only we can come to the place where we can believe what the word of God says, what Jesus says in his word, if only we can believe. This is exactly what Jesus said to Jairus. When Jairus came, another man of high standing, comes to Jesus, his daughter is gravely sick at the point of death. Jesus says, I will come and heal her. He was disturbed by a woman with an issue of blood. Some time lapsed. And when Jesus says, okay, Jairus, let's go. Some servants come and say, don't bother the master. It's too late. She has already died. What did Jesus say? Fear not. Only believe. Only believe. 
The word of God tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is why we have services as we do on a Friday night. This is what it's designed for, to build faith in us so that we can receive, not just when we come to the altar after the service. We must have the kind of faith, having heard the word of God, trusted God, taken him at his word, we should be able to go out the door and exercise that kind of faith in Christ to believe that he will answer our cries. It's not just faith to believe here. It's faith to believe, period. Wherever you go, whatever be the case, only believe. Only believe. If like the nobleman, we choose to believe without signs and wonders, because Jesus made the statement to him, you will not believe except you see signs and wonders. But he did not see any sign. He did not see any wonder. He just took Jesus at his word and departed. Let me say to you tonight that signs and wonders are an authentic work of the kingdom of God. Jesus says it in Mark 16, 17. He says, these signs shall follow you as many as believe. But you see, we must not follow signs. Jesus did not say to follow signs. Jesus says, signs will follow. So that signs and wonders are authentic and an authentic work of the kingdom of God. But our faith must not be centered on them. If you hear right now that the little church next door, I never see anybody in it, but um, it have a little church next door if you didn't know that. And if you hear that miracles were taking place, the deaf were hearing, the blind were seeing, the lame was walking, and I am preaching, believe the word. You know, you run there. Don't tell me no, because you only have to hear, you have an evangelist doing signs and wonders, and it's just scarce. Don't mind after, after the signs and wonders, they're telling you you'd have somebody in the congregation who could, pay, who could give $15,000. Tell you all them. Sick. God is sick. God says there is somebody in the congregation. <laughs> no, God says there are about five people in the congregation who can give $10,000. Not TT, US. <laughs> I want to know. 30 years of preaching, God never tell me something like that. <laughs> How is it? How is it? And I just preach that he's no respecter of person, but like he, he have no respect for me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let us leave that alone. <laughs> If, like the nobleman, we choose to believe without signs and wonders, signs and wonders will take place. But we must not be a follower of the sign. We must be, the signs must follow us. This is what the Bible says. And our faith must not be centered upon them. Rather, we must believe in Jesus because of who he is. Who is he? God's the Son, our Lord and Savior, who redeemed us by his precious blood. This is the one we must follow. This is the one we must believe. And signs will follow. We should not be following signs. 
He is the one to be worshipped. He is the one to be esteemed. Because of his love, his mercy, his holiness, and his righteous character, not just for what he can give to us, but because of who he is. This is the people that God is looking for. Not a people who would run after him for bread and fishes. Multitudes followed him because of bread and fishes. But then when the rubber met the road, when he says, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't be my disciples. There all of them went. They went back to home to look for more bread. Capernaum, where his son was, was a whole day's journey away from Galilee. There were no motor vehicles in those days. It meant, therefore, that to leave Capernaum and return the next day would have taken two days. The next day journey was one day, and when he came, that would be another day. And his servant met him on the way and told him as he was going back the next day. It has to be the next day because Capernaum is one day's journey from Galilee. And if you took one day to come to Galilee, it will take you another day to get back to Capernaum. So it was the next day. that he was going back and he met his servants coming. And his servant said, your son lives. Your son lives. And we want to remember that the boy was at the point of death. Jesus didn't go. He didn't Speak a word of healing. He just told the man, go your way. Your son lives. And he asked the servants, what hour did the son, did his son began to mend? I want you to listen carefully. Because this, this, this is where the message is. And it's something that could easily slip our minds as we read this text. The nobleman asks his servant the hour that his son began to mend. And they said, yesterday, the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew, according to verse 53, it was the same hour in which Jesus said, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. That's verse 53. But let me draw your attention to a very salient point that can be easily overlooked as we read the text. And one that is important for us to understand when we come to Jesus for healing or for any matter at all. The nobleman did not ask his servant when was his son healed. Look in your Bibles again. He did not ask his servants when was his son healed. The servants came and says, your son lives. The boy that was dying, now he lives. The nobleman did not ask his servants, when was his son healed? He asked him, at what hour did he, what? Begin. At what hour did he begin to amend? What is the point? They answered, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. They did not say he got well. 
Yesterday at the seventh hour, they said the fever left him in answer to the question, at what hour did he begin to mend? What is the point here? So it was the hour Jesus said, thy son liveth, that the healing began. But we don't know when it was completed. We don't know that it was instantaneous. Read the Gospels. You will see instant healing. You will see immediately his eyes were open. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when he came back, he came back a scene. It was not an instantaneous healing. He began to mend at the seventh hour, the same hour that Jesus said, Thy son liveth. Nowhere here it says that he got healed at that moment. It was not an instantaneous healing. Why am I making heavy weather of that? Because too often as children of God, when we go before the Lord, we expect instant answers. Instant healing, just as we have instant coffee and instant this. We want everything instant from God. Does this mean that he can't do it instantly? Yes, he can. But there are times when he won't. And with wisdom. I have told you this before. There was a Friday night many, many years ago, right here at this altar. A young lady came for healing. We prayed on a, for her, and she went away after the service. Outside in the foyer, she was distressed because she was still having the manifestations of the problem. She was disturbed. She left the disturbed. At 11.32 that night, she called me, and she said, Pastor, you will not believe what happened. But why wouldn't I believe? I was the one preaching. <laughs> you will not believe what happened. I went to the bathroom, and the problem started to be, to mend. <laughs> It was a bloody issue. If Jesus had immediately, oh, praise God, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> if Jesus had immediately, as she thought it would have, then everything would have happened right here in front of, we didn't have carpet at the time, but oh gosh, I mean, help me, please, Lord, you could, you could wait. <laughs> The point is, we must not think that when we go to the Lord, what has to happen must happen now, like yesterday. If not yesterday, well, tomorrow. No, there are times when there is instantaneous healing, instantaneous answers to prayer, and there are times when there's progressive healing. There are times when out of his wisdom he will not do it immediately such as with the young lady that we're talking about. But however it's done, we must continue believing. We must continue having faith. This is what Jesus says. Have faith in God. He didn't say for a time. He didn't say for a moment. Have faith. It doesn't happen now. Have faith in God. It doesn't happen next week. Have faith in God. It doesn't happen next year. Have faith in God. Only believe. I've said it so many times here and I'll say it again. Between the prayer and the answer, God is working something out. And I happen to know that when he's working, it's always for something good. 
And if it is already good, he works for something even better. So there are times when, having come to Jesus, the healing may begin, but not be instantaneous. It could very well be that Jesus would defer the healing to an appropriate time, such as the one I told you about with the young lady. So having read the text and having heard the preaching, what can we arrive at from this message tonight, apart from the fact that healing can be progressive? I'll tell you some. One, that Jesus has an intimate knowledge of all things. He knew the case of this boy. The father did not tell him what the boy was suffering with, but he healed him of that very thing. He's an all-knowing God. Don't tell me it was because he was walking the face of the earth. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is God. He does not change. Jesus knew the extent of the boy's disease without the father. He did not ask the father what was wrong with his son. We see the benevolence of Jesus, ever ready to aid, to heal, to save, He is never called upon, and he will not answer. Only believe. His word says, call unto me, and I will answer you. Jesus can touch you personally. I heard a testimony on Tuesday, you're going to hear it sometime when it's testimony time. But I'll give you a preview. Young lady, she's here tonight. She comes to me many times. But when I say many times, a few times, well, we prayed with her. Because she feels this big lump pressing her heart. She thought it was heart. I give her some tablets for, I pray doctor sometimes. Huh? <laughs> yeah, you see, if, if I suffer with something, <laughs> if I suffer with something and I get a tablet, they heal me, and you come and tell me you suffer, and I give it to you, too, you know. <laughs> yeah, prescribing. <laughs> yeah. So I had a reflux problem, and she, what, she, what she's talking about, it sounds identical to what I had. So I, I, I give her some gastro to take. <laughs> I know it wouldn't kill her, it could only help her. But it didn't help. It didn't help, it wasn't that. So she went to the doctor and she went to the doctor and she went to the doctor and the doctor tell her this and the doctor tell her that and the doctor tell her the other. And then I think she did an x-ray and it showed up one big mass in her chest. And the doctor told her he has to operate. I don't know if I get in the story right, if he had to do it some other time or what, but he had to operate. And she remembered the message I preached here. What was it? Um, it was the three Jewish boys in the fire. Um, yeah, what was it? What was the theme? Um, Regard something like that? What, what, what? No, not never. No matter what. No matter what. So she went away. Lord, no matter what. <laughs> Lord, no matter what. Lord, no matter what. And then she came back and told me. When she went back to the doctor, they could not find 
the mass in her body. No matter. She can tell all you. I ain't give it to you the right way. But you get the sense, right? God, the Lord only wants us to stand in faith, believing no matter what. This does not mean that he can't use doctors. This doesn't mean that he can't use medication. We read in the Bible with King Hezekiah. They still had to make a poultice and put it on his boil. Boils don't kill people. It had to be something big. But Jesus, but God gave him 15 more years. But they still had to put the poultice on the boil. So, yes, God will use medication. I am on medication right now. Don't come and tell me I don't have faith. Yes, I have faith. Plenty, plenty of faith to believe that God have me alive here today. This is why I say praise God for doctors, praise God for medical science, praise God for the medical profession. Yes. And I have a lovely doctor at that. So the point is that we see that the miracle healing is not always instantaneous, but it can indeed be progressive. Tonight, we are going to pray specifically for healing. If anything I have said made sense to you, and you believe with all your heart, not doubting, that this Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever, is right here because he says where two or three are gathered in his midst, in, in, yes, he is in the midst of us. These things happen when you are coming on to 67. <laughs> Wait, hold on. You're going to get there. All right? And I wouldn't laugh at you. So we want, to, we want to understand if we have gleaned anything from the word, if we would take him at his word, if we would believe no matter what, your problem could be resolved. And I'm not saying tonight. Tonight can be the night when you begin to amend based on your belief because the man departed believing the word that Jesus spoke. All I did tonight was to speak the word of the Lord. Would you stand, please? And as the choir prepares to sing, if you are here and you are in need of healing tonight, specifically healing tonight, the Spirit works with the Word, and the Word accomplishes what the Spirit will. If you would believe, and you are sick in your body, it's not the virus, but you are sick in the body, come to the altar, let us pray with you. Only believe. Only believe. Come on.
in. Just shut yourself in with the Lord tonight. Just shut yourself in with the Lord. He is the one. He is the healer. It's not the hands that are laid upon you. Yes, he did say lay hands. And he did say pray the prayer of faith. But we are not the healer. He is. physician. He's able to do the same things he did when he walked in the face of the earth. He's able to do the same things we read in the gospel. You just call on him now. You know your need and he knows your need. You call upon him. Don't wait, don't wait for someone to come and pray with you. Yes, we will do that. But you exercise in your faith. You exercise in your faith. You believe with all your heart that he is able, that he is more than able to do that which you ask. He says, call upon me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you know not. Come on, you talk to him. You believe that he is able. He is able. He is able. He is more than able. He is more than able. He is the same Jesus yesterday, today and forever. He's here tonight. He sent the word specifically for healing tonight. He is the living word. He sent his word to heal. He's present. He's present. Now if you can, take one hand and rest it on the place that you are believing in. Him for healing. Rest your hand on that place. Continue, continue talking to him, exercising your faith, believing. Yes, just believing. He's here. He's here. He's here present. He has sent his word. He keeps his word. He keeps his word. He's the keeper of his word. He holds his word 
higher than his name, he says. He sent the word to heal, specifically tonight. 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 Tonight is your night. Tonight is your night. He sent it specifically. Just believe him. Just believe him. Don't believe me. Believe him. Believe his word. He is able. Now we are going to ask the ministers to come. Brother Glenroy, will you come? Dr. Roberts, will you come? Brother Lyndon, will you come? Each one of you preach the word of God. You preach healing. Now come lay, lay your hands. Lay your hands. Come, Kenneth. Lay hands. Spend a little time. Spend a little time. If you have to rebuke, rebuke. Spirit. If you have to exercise faith. Just, just whatever we do. Everyone here. The healing must begin tonight. It must begin tonight. It must begin tonight. The Spirit works with the Word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we believe your Word to be true. We speak your Word to your people only because we believe in its power. We believe that it's true. And now, Lord, we take you at your word, Mark 16 and 17, that we shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. We stand upon your word. Your word is true. You are not a man that you should lie. You said your word is like the rain, like the snow. It comes down. It doesn't go back. It accomplishes the purpose whereunto you send it. You sent your word for healing tonight. Lord, I pray, I pray divine healing, divine healing, divine healing, divine healing upon every person that will exercise the faith to believe tonight. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.
Jesus is still a miracle worker. He is still a miracle worker. The greatest miracle is experienced by millions around the world today. The greatest miracle have been experienced by each and every one of us with perhaps one or two exceptions. What is this miracle? It is the miracle of the new birth. When one is born out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. When by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, just merely believing in him and what he has done at Calvary, embracing him as your Lord and Savior, the miracle of all miracles takes place. A sinner is translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God in a moment, in just a moment. And what happens in that moment determines whether your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life or it's not written. Jesus said it this way to a man called Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And today we take born again as if it is a religion. No, it's a relationship. Being born of the Spirit of God, reconciled to God, where you now can call God Father and mean Father because you are a born child of God. So if you're here tonight, you have never had this miracle in your life. You have never experienced the miraculous working power of God coming into you and beginning a change translating you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God tonight can be your night all you have to do is to open your heart and believe that he's able to save you and call upon him asking him to come into your heart as a matter of fact I'll help you with it can't do it for you but I can help you with the prayer. If you would have me pray with you, why don't you just wave, wave your hand, raise your hand wherever you are. Any takers? Anyone will say to Jesus tonight, Lord Jesus, I want to be born of your spirit. Anyone? Anyone? You know, it never ceases to amaze me that people will come to the altar to ask Jesus for healing but they wouldn't want to receive him as savior they want the blessing and not the blesser but thank God for each and every one of us who knows you know that you know that you know that you know that you are born of the Spirit of God. Any here tonight know that? You know that you know that you know that you know? Father, I thank you so very much for tonight. I thank you for your leading, the leading of your Spirit this morning when I sought your face. Inquiring of you the direction of the service tonight and your plan and your purpose in the service. I thank you, Lord, for the word and I thank you for what has been accomplished in your people by you tonight. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you that there are going to be testimonies of what transpired here tonight. And we give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. We bless your holy, wonderful name, Lord Jesus. 
We thank you so very, very much for your goodness and your mercies. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you richly. You may be seated.